So hello, my name is Rebecca Zabarski with Parrot Analytics, and you are watching the Global TV Demand Awards Virtual Festival, which celebrates the people behind the world's most popular TV and talent. I have the pleasure to be speaking with Colin Hobach, creator, writer, and director of HBO's Q Into the Storm, which is a finalist for the most in-demand true crime series of 2021. Great to be here with you, Colin. Cool. I, I was excited to uh, excited to learn about uh, yeah this this festival and uh, the kind of work you you all are doing. Awesome. So let's get started. I've got a lot of questions for you. Um, so you know you took us on a journey that was one hell of a ride to witness throughout the show. Q into the storm. Why was telling the story of QAnon so important to you? Uh, <laughs> well. Um, I mean, at first off, I love a good mystery, right? Uh, and at, at the time, uh, it was hard for me to think of a, a bigger mystery than who was who was operating behind the scenes of, of of QAnon. You know, I also felt that that unmasking who was behind Q uh, might bring this whole kind of game that was evolving into a political movement that would would end up being very consequential in the future to its logical conclusion. Um, so I thought of it kind of like a, a magic trick, you know, if you if you reveal the magic trick, uh, it can't work again. Fascinating. And I, I can, if when you're watching, you get a sense of the game, right? I mean, and you've actually set that up in terms of how you created the documentary. There are gaming elements, gaming sounds. That was actually something I picked up on very early in the series of even just like the music that you selected. Um, there were some really interesting choices. I, I want to hear more about that, um, that idea of bringing this um, real life situation, obviously, into that gaming reference. Was that intended? Oh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, this is my experience following Q kind of from the beginning until we get to um, their involvement in, on January the 6th. You know, and, and I think a lot of people who are following it, um, either on the chans or... Uh, on Reddit or as, as it kind of grew. And in the beginning, kind of had one foot in, one foot out. They thought of it as a game. They, they sort of knew it was a LARP, but part of it was believing that it wasn't really a game. And you know, if you believe something long enough, you eventually become that thing. And so there's this sort of transmutation that happened to a lot of people who are following Q where they really did start to believe it. Um, it and the ideas of Q, uh, the, the premise, um, certain aspects of it kind of memed themselves into reality. Um, you know, by the end of the series, for instance, you see that Ron Watkins, who we point as being um, sort of the, being kind of the linchpin behind Q, um, you know, you see that he does shockingly now have access to the seat of power. In some ways, he's advising um, he's advising Trump at that point. So, um, you know, and this was kind of the story that Q was saying in the beginning. It was, it kind of wished itself into existence. And so we wanted to capture that stylist. Um, so be, beginning with this sort of premise, even the opening of, of the series itself starts with a Q drop that says, this is a game, you know, this is not a game, this is a game, right? Um, uh, and the dance of that. And so we even did it sonically, you know, in, in episode one at the end, um, you know, you hear, um, you hear kind of the white rabbit, uh, you know, play and it's a, it's like a chip tune kind of version. And then you get to the end of the series, uh, with sort of hallucinogenic experiences as these figures are dressed up, some of them in, 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 in like warrior LARP apparel, right? You get the, sh the Q shaman, um, in, 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 in the capital. Uh, and there you hear White Rabbit again, but this time it's a it's it's like a marching choral sound. You, you all of these sort of women sort of uh, singing in a in a in a that has that draws this sense of, of of like an army, um, you know, because it really had leapt from um, screen into reality. Um, and so that's what we were trying to what we were trying to capture with, with the sound, but then also with the, the design, the kind of mapping of of this this. Um, alternate reality on top of reality. 
um, which is very much what Q was. It was the, this sort of fiction that was drawn upon uh, real characters and real life events um, that people could uh, participate in as a kind of interactive game. Um, but of course, they didn't necessarily see it that way. And, and so, yeah, we were trying to capture that, um, capture that uh, through the music, through the graphics, and through the storytelling. Yeah, it does that really well. There's many times where um, you're confused about, you know, how reality isn't really matching what we're seeing online, right? These people and the, the conversations and the tone, I would say, maybe like the confidence um, that people used when they're posting on those sites and also when they're sharing those cue memes, it doesn't often match the reality of the people who are actually posting it and what they look like or who they are in their real life. That was something that really struck me, um, you know, and, and I, I, I wonder when you were meeting so many people um, throughout your travels, because that was a huge part of the making the show. You traveled all over the world to make this. I mean, where where exactly did this show take you? Well, that's what's interesting about QAnon, even though it seemingly was this American phenomenon, of course it went global, but the people who were behind QAnon who popularized it, who ran the boards, you know, they, they didn't even live in America for the most part. You know, so I was, when I was chasing Q, I, I went to Japan, the Philippines, Italy, um, South Africa, um, and some other countries that I didn't even include <laughs> because uh, they were, they were um, kind of fruitless rabbit holes. But uh, yeah, really, really all over the world, um, uh, trying to paint a picture of the network that made Q possible. Um, so in terms of the data and analytics behind the show, we know that there's been a jump in demand for this type of show at all, like documentary series and the true crime subgenre. Uh, in fact, demand is actually outpacing supply for documentary series over the past year. Um, we saw that from January 2019, so actually a few years ago, to March 2021, the number of documentary series increased by 63% but the demand grew by 142%. So again, demand for this type of show, it's outpacing supply. And the, the second point that we found is that true crime was not only the biggest documentary subgenre, but it's also growing the fastest. So, uh, you know, when we look at Q into the storm, the, during this year, uh, the show had nearly 10 times the demand of the average show in general, and that's on a global global wow. scale. So why do you think that's that, incredible. yeah, and, and like you said, uh, it, what's interesting about that is, you know, you think that the story is uniquely American considering its ultimate climax, January 6th, um, but you were traveling all over the world to actually tell the story. So my question- And Q has become a global phenomenon, right? Like you, it, in some ways it's even copy paste. Like if you look in Brazil, there was, you know, there were, there were protests uh, kind of in favor of like Bolsonaro, right? And you had a, you had a Brazilian Q shaman just in Brazil colors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's an Australian flavor. There's an Italian flavor of Q now where they've, they've cast their own sort of political class um, into the narrative. Mm -hmm. So it really, it, 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 and this is something I was seeing while I was making the project as well, is that it was becoming a kind of global phenomenon, mm -hmm. um, in part because the internet's global, right? So mm -hmm. ideology is inherently decentralized. And so something like QAnon is borderless. Right, right. Like you said, copy paste is kind of, has perhaps become a template, an unfortunate template for that type of ideology to bloom uh, around the world. So why do you think that this is, these type of stories are so appealing um, all over? You know, certainly the, this particular one that you've shared about Q, but just in general, the true crime documentary series, why do you think that's becoming so popular right now? Well, I think that uh, Q Into the Storm is a little different than your typical true crime, in part because it's not chasing a murderer. <laughs> right, an unsolved murder. Uh, it's a different kind of mystery. And it's a mystery that affects everyone. Um, you know, th this would be like, you're looking into a sort of whodunit, a why done it that's affecting the lives of the viewers themselves. So um, I think that the audience that was, was, was watching this show 
um, felt a personal connection to the investigation. You know, I was trying to play the role of sort of the surrogate as an investigator here and take the audience along, you know, the same journey that I experienced. Um, but I think I think that's that's perhaps why I, this is the first time I'm hearing that there was like ten times more demand or something for this sh this show. But um, hearing that, it, it, I, I, my estimation of why would would partially be because of um, because of that sort of personal investment because there's an, a unique because of the effect that Q had on the lives of so many people. You know, they wanted to know who was behind it as well and what this network was, and they wanted. I think that there was an investment to to see that unmasked. Um, we we also tried a different style with this project. You know, I, I it was a style that I I felt emulated the world from which Q had had emerged. Um, I, I tend to to try to find darkly comedic <laughs> elements in the stories that I tell. Um, humor in a way allows me to deal with some of this uh, with, with, with the darker side of humanity. Um, you know, tragedy and comedy are two sides of the same coin. Uh, so um, I guess we don't see quite as much of that in the true crime genre in general. Um, you know, playing around with with uh, other other genre um, and, and not being afraid to in, inject humor or find humor, particularly if the characters themselves have humorous traits, um, you know, uh, and, and just was kind of showing those characters for for what they are. Um, and also, you know, we're, we're going into a, a world here that I think a lot of people were just curious about, whether it's the Chans or um, just the, the, these 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 networks that perhaps seem very scary on the on the surface when you're just online, but when you just see the the reality of who's who's behind <laughs> who's actually behind it, um, it, it, it changes how you see Q as a whole. It does. It felt almost like an educational experience as I watched the show. Well, it was an educational experience because these are things that I had heard of and again seen some reports or memes online, but I was, um, you know, brought into this world safely. It, it, you know, you sort of guided the viewer into a world that is scary for many. Yeah, there's, there's a whole vocabulary that you have to be able, uh, that you have to sort of know in order to be able to play the role of investigator. You have to understand where Q was born, right? The, the chans, um, in order to be able to in order to be able to start to decipher who might actually be behind it. Um, you know, and, one, and, that, and that's one of the other things that we did as well is like plant clues along the way that would, would help an audience um, kind of piece, piece it together. Because, uh, my gosh, there was, um, there was so much information that we had to leave on the cutting room floor. Um, you know, either false paths, red herrings, or just more forensic evidence that, uh, that, that, um, that, wasn't necessary in order to be able to uh, paint a case for who was really behind you. So we didn't have to, we didn't, we didn't include obviously every, every single piece of evidence that we, uh, that we had. Yeah. Um, and this was of course a challenge with a project like this as well, because timing is everything. Mm -hmm. you know, we were in a race against the clock to get this, this to air. I mean, we cut this series in less than five months. Wow. You know, from the from the point that HBO picked it up in September of 2020, we went to air in March of 2021. You know that pressure cooker. Um, I think it was unlike anything that any editor had ever experienced, myself included. Hmm. Um, you know, it was like uh, and, and putting together this series, which is like clockwork. You know, you have to have the clues planted earlier in, in episodes one and two for those final episodes to work. Um, but we had locked episode one before before we had really started cutting episode six, um, you know, before we we knew that what was going to happen on the sixth. Right. Um, we had to go back and retool it just a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, that that uh, I think there was something that that uh, I mean, it was necessary. Um, it, you know, if the, if the series was releasing right now, I don't know if it would be as impactful. Mm. Yeah, it was developing in real time. 
as you as you were creating it, you know, that's that is unique uh, within the genre when often these stories are being told, you know, 20 years later, right? Um, I do think absolutely that's one reason why it was so impactful around the world. Um, and then, you know, there's something also that is very intriguing and it's this sense of danger throughout the series. Um, of course, you know, as the viewer, we're sitting at home on a couch sort of watching this, but you said it, within the series, there's always been this undercurrent of danger when speaking about investigating Q uh, and, and creating the show. And, um, you know, I'm curious, were there specific moments that you felt personally in danger while you were making the series? Oh, sure. You know, <laughs> that's why I, uh, I like to inject some levity uh, in, into uh, these situations um, and let a little bit of the oxygen out. But uh, yeah, um, I mean, from a security standpoint, you know, we were we were filming with hacker, world class hackers, black belt hackers, or you want to call them, you know, trolls, um, you know, the guy who like, created anonymous and all of these individuals are trying to find out things about each other as well. So sometimes it's not necessarily um, just me that has to or like the project or protecting characters from each other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cause I, I was bouncing back and forth between sides that really hate each other, like on a, on a massive, <laughs> you know, trying to put each other in prison on a like global scale. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think that experience of danger. Well, did you feel it when you were watching the series? Like, did, yeah, did you I did. Feel... I felt my heart beat faster and my palms get sweaty. Uh, and that feeling of like, is this a good idea? <laughs> or should he be doing this? That's what I felt. So I was thinking, so, is this what he yeah. now as a as a filmmaker as a you know as a documentarian is this what you're chasing you know be other than the story just in terms of of this being your career that was my question you know from from well, this if, if i i try to remind myself when i'm in a moment like that that the audience will have the same experience so whatever i'm feeling in a given moment if i'm asking myself that question like is this a good idea which i asked more than once uh along the way certainly that the audience would probably have be having a similar a similar kind of experience which which um i try to lean into those moments you know mm -hmm. um calculated risk mm -hmm. um which is also sort of necessary for getting a story like this mm -hmm. you got to go to the pig farm right Mm -hmm. um and uh and in a moment like that you don't know um like i didn't know quite what i was dealing with yet you know we're going to a remote location in manila you know who owns a pig farm as everyone kind of knows that's off pigs are a good way to dispose of human bodies right so there's a little bit of that implication that th of that threat um and and the characters were leaning into that as well mm -hmm. i mean danger fear being you know uh, infamy uh, these things that they're sort of chasing is this um that's that's also their marketing it's their brand is being yeah scary. i noticed so that. what's the line between their brand and reality and do they even know the difference and you know with the with the characters that someone like jim watkins or ron watkins might be playing at any point in time yes um, do they even know the difference between the character and, and who they really are anymore? And if you see the whole world as a game, mm -hmm. um, what might you be willing to do? How far might you be willing to, to take those actions? And if you see yourself as a villain in that game um, and, and you're able to separate yourself from the actions of that villain, um, you know, that's a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, um, but I want to know, what is something you learned about yourself as a storyteller while you were making this show over the several years that you, you took to create this? Learned, learned about myself. Mm -hmm. There's a follow-up um, to that. There's a follow-up to that. Um, oh, I guess, I guess I have like a bit of a... Um, like a, a diplomatic, <laughs> I, 
I learned that I, I learned that I, I have more um, more of an inclination inclination for diplomacy than I realized um, that I like de escalation. You know, I think a lot of um, one of the things that troubles me um, as a as a documentary filmmaker is is the um, the kind of conundrum uh, that when something that bad happens to a character, it's good for a story. Um, the conflict is good for a story. Um, and because I wrestle with that problem, I overtly resist it. And I try to, sometimes I will find myself um, making suggestions to the characters that might make their lives a little bit better or easier or, or smooth things out, which I think is directly in opposition to what would make for the most uh, entertaining story. But, uh, but I do find that, that not just with the characters, but more broadly, you know, I'm interested in de-escalating polarization in, in society, um, getting the right and left to talk again, um, figuring out ways to do that, um, and, and capturing stories that, that, um, you know, uh, put cameras with opposing sides, um, and perhaps that's part of why I, I do that. Is 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 an, is is an interest in f facilitating some kind of dialogue between those sides. Mm -hmm. What do you think you learned about humanity while you were creating this series and interacting with both of those sides that you mentioned? Oh, um, that we need to be careful what we pretend to be <laughs> and um and that it's and just how easy it is for very intelligent people to come up become convinced of crazy things or seemingly or wild things um especially in a vacuum um, especially when we're just plugged into a screen and we've lost we were untethered from community and from family and from friends, how easy it is for us to get caught up in a good story or to um, believe something um, because it might give us more control in our own lives. Um, um, like having that sort of, having uh, knowledge that, that, or feeling like you have this kind of special knowledge. Um, that, it, it surprised me how, how much of the population um can would be capable of entertaining um a notion like maybe the whole world is really run by a, a you know a group of elite global pedophiles right like and i think that at one point there was a study done by that was done by both the new york times and another one done by npr that showed that like more than 50 percent of americans thought that might be true that's what we got to that you know, we got to um, more than 17% of Americans believing in the central tenets of QAnon. Um, that's pretty wild. So how is that possible? Um, and I think what we saw is that the isolation and COVID um, and, and more specifically algorithms, uh, we're all of this, we're all just gasoline on, on, a, on this kind of fire of, of like wild theories. Um, and, and, and what individuals were, were willing to entertain. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I often come back to the algorithms, you know, I, I mean, I made a film previously about digital privacy and, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like this, this series tackles this sort of question of, of, of free speech, um, that, that a lot of people seem to have right now, you know, he was testing the limits of free speech. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and. A lot of times I would get asked with my previous film, I'd screen it and talk to an audience. It was called Terms and Conditions May Apply. And they'd be like, well, what's the, you know, what's the cost of all of the, I mean, I know you're in sort of the data business, right? But what was the cost of, of handing over our like, you know, the most personal details about ourselves um, to, to big tech, you know, thousands of data points on each of us. You know, is it just to market to us or is there something, something else? And I think that this polarization that we're seeing now is a is a that's the something that's the something else that's what was that was the real cost mm -hmm. um it was when all of that personal data then got fed into fed to algorithms that drove us into echo chambers and ramped up the polarization mm -hmm. yeah, that was that was the real cost um and so um 
what surprises me is is yeah how effective those algorithms really are at at um you know manipulating us and i think that that and manipulating belief so what i was saying before about why people you know it's this sort of invisible hand that's that knows us that's manipulating us um that we don't see and and just how and just how capable that hand really is mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to see the changes in um, privacy and, uh, you know, how less willing younger generations are in giving away their information. Um, you know, mm. there are studies that show, like Gen Z, they're more interested or, or they're, they care more about privacy. And you'll see that, um, you know, with ads now that target those, um, uh, that generation that say, you know, privacy is 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 our number one priority. Uh, and that's not the kind of thing that we saw maybe 10, 15 years ago when people went from my generation were using technology and kind of entering into conversations and using apps and really openly and and freely offering our information in exchange for you know instant gratification, let's say. Um, so I, I find that really interesting to see how it changes generationally. And it's a little too early to say, I don't, you know, I'm not a, a researcher in that respect, but I, I just kind of watch it from afar and I can see a, 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 a bit of a change in the way that people are, you know, less willing to offer up everything. I mean, that makes me optimistic, yeah. <laughs> but usually it's, it's a pendulum that swings when you've experienced a cost. Right. Um, yes. And it's good to know that this generation is, 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 is aware of it and is pursuing you know, secure, private, encrypted solutions. And yeah. that that's a viable business model now. Um, yeah. and, and that, it's, and that hopefully it, it will, it'll lead to privacy being by default. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, the, the companies that like, well, we don't have to go into, <laughs> into, uh, you know, who, who are the, who, who benefits the most from data mining right. out there. Uh, but, um, yeah, but, but, uh, it, it is, it, you know, I think six, seven years ago, it, there were a lot of companies that were trying to sell privacy and trying to build themselves as privacy forward services mm -hmm. um, that were just, they were kind of struggling. And yeah, now it seems like they're, those companies are, whether it's a search engine like DuckDuckGo mm -hmm. or it's just a messenger app, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, Telegram or something like that, right? Yeah. That, that, that people are moving more towards that. Or you had something like Snapchat, which, mm -hmm gave the illusion of privacy, gave people the sense that it was private um, and showed that people had a desire for that. But right. of course, when it was revealed that it wasn't really that, really that private, I don't, I don't know, uh, that just kind of went away, right? That, that yeah. Snapchat was close to being one of these like new <laughs> tech behemoths and it's, it's, uh, I haven't heard about it very much lately. So. Yeah, people have sort of moved on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, I guess now as, it's as they do. Um, <laughs> So I have a, a last question for you. Uh, you know, the theme of our virtual festival this year is revolutionary. And that seems fitting to, um, as a theme, you know, talking about the story of QAnon um, and certainly what you've created with Q into the storm. Um, but my question is, is more of a, a general, um, general question for you. You know, what do you think is most revolutionary about entertainment in 2021 and then looking ahead into 2022? most revolutionary um i mean i remain excited by the uh the interest the, the, the audience interest in in long form storytelling um and the fact that you said that you know the the amount of doc series that have been um that have been uh, funded was up 60 something percent, but demand is over a hundred percent or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that that makes me really optimistic mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel like the devil's in the details. Um, I like long form storytelling. I always feel like I need more time. <laughs> and and so uh, and so the um, the fact that yeah, with the, I mean with our series we were still confined to kind of sixty minute window, but that but that restraints on the, the, the length that you can tell a story have, have largely been lifted. Mm -hmm. um, even if an episode has to be under 60 minutes, you can still have this longer window to tell a, to tell a, to tell a, um, 
you know, a, a much more holistic story or to, or to capture real time events, kind of like Q while drilling into, you know, um, all the forensic details around how something like Q could be possible. So, you know, I remain, um, I remain um, optimistic and excited by that, that, that audiences, you know, care about, care about details and are excited by more than just murder mysteries.